Hey, welcome everyone to the last Global NCG seminar to be broadcast from the Americas in, in 2021. Uh, after this seminar, we shall resume on January the 14th with uh, Gilles Pizier. But uh, not before we enjoy today's lecture. It's a great pleasure to have Graham Siegel uh, with us. I hope he's somewhere there, still with us, uh, who will speak on wick rotation and the positivity of energy in quantum field theory. Please, Graham. Well, I'm honored to be invited to speak to this seminar. I hadn't, when I was invited, been asked to speak in a seminar for quite a long time, actually. So it's, it's almost a throwback experience for me to be giving a talk. Um, I'm going to talk about the positivity of energy in quantum field theory. Um, and I'll just, yes. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's begin right at the beginning. In conventional quantum mechanics, <clears throat> we consider physical systems their states are represented by rays in a complex Hilbert space. And the states evolve by a one parameter group of unitary operators generated by a self a joint operator H called the Hamiltonian. A very long time ago, when I was new to the mathematical world, one of the first visits I made was to the IHES and I felt very proud to get into conversation with René Tom. And he started talking about quantum mechanics and said the great mystery of the subject was the role of the complex numbers, which he said have <clears throat> no corresponding role at all in classical mechanics. I was feeling tremendously honored and flattered to be in this conversation. But at the same time, I thought, well, that, that's rather the kind of thing old people say. And I, I was sort of a typical sort of young mathematician. Now I'm much older than Tom was then, and I think more and more that the role of the complex numbers is one of the great mysteries in quantum theory. Uh, and that's what this talk is about. In particular, the complex numbers are connected with the positivity of energy, because the positivity of energy is the fact that this self-adjoint operator, the Hamiltonian, is positive. Uh, well, that doesn't immediately seem to involve the complex numbers, but you can very quickly reformulate it in the following way. It's equivalent to saying that the one parameter unitary group of time evolution is actually the boundary value of an operator valued function defined in the upper half plane of the complex plane. So the positivity of energy somehow creates for you a larger domain for time. And one way of thinking about the matter is of course that space time actually, you can actually work in some complexified version of space time. Well, that's not quite the picture I'm going to present today. In fact, in the sense, I'm trying to get away from that. But let me just point out quickly that it's a very strong constraint that one has this positive energy property. Some people sometimes, it was first perhaps pointed out by Fermi in the, about 1930 or something, that uh, it shows that nothing can happen for the first time. You, you can't have pandemics. If your state has been in some subspace of the Hilbert space for any non-zero length of time, then it's going to stay there forever. So this is a very strong constraint on the way things can evolve. And the relationship between the unitary group of time evolution and the what happens along the complex axis in the half plane, the contraction semigroup, that's the relationship which is described as wick rotation. And the object of this talk is to try and produce an analog of this correspondence in quantum field theory. Quantum field theory differs from general quantum mechanics by the fact that the observables are localized in space. So 
what we're trying to do is understand how energy is local. Well, um, quantum field theory is usually described by an axiom system, which goes back to Whiteman and stated in terms of local field operators and vacuum expectation values of those operators. But uh, the paper that Maxim Konsevich and I have written, which I'm talking about, is a rival axiomatization in which, which in a way is closer in spirit to the original idea of the one parameter semi-group. Semi we replace the one parameter semi-group by a functor, where instead of a time interval t, we have an actual space-time manifold, which is meant to be space-time evolving from some hypersurface, some constant past time to a corresponding situation at some future time. So we replace the time interval by this segment of space time. And the one big assumption I'm making in the talk is that space is that the spatial slices are themselves compact. I might say a little bit more about that later on, but for the moment, let's take that as our data. So, uh, Sorry, may I have a question? Sorry? May I interrupt with the question? Yes, do, yes. So do. You, are, you are saying that this is a functor, so uh, this is with respect to inclusions on, on the space-time manifolds, or? Uh, respect to what I'd call concatenation. When you have two of these things, uh, well, let me just say one more word and come back to that question. Uh, we want to think of these cobordisms as forming a category, and a category is the same thing as a semi-groupoid. Everyone knows what a group is. A semi-group is a weakening of the notion of a group where things are not required to have inverses. The elements are not required to have inverses. The groupoid is another weakening of the notion of a group where the elements of the groupoid go from somewhere to somewhere else and can only be composed if one begins where the other ends. Uh, well, a category then is a semi-groupoid. It's a thing, a set of things which you can sometimes compose because each of the elements has a beginning and an ending and you can only compose things that fit end to end. And that's the sense in which uh, I'm talking about a functor. These you think of this picture of a space-time M as being something that goes from an initial spatial slice sort to a final spatial slice sigma one. And you can string together things if the outgoing slice of one is the incoming slice of the other. I see. So, I that, see. Thank you. so that, that answers the question, I hope, does it? Yes, 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 thank you. So, uh, so we want to think of a quantum field theory as a representation of this category, or as I said, semi-groupoid. Um, the advantage of this picture is meant to be that it's a one-stop shop. You see, in the Whiteman axioms, one has to have a whole panoply of things set up. One has to have, say, what the fields are, and how they behave. They have to have commutation properties, locality properties, all kinds of things. This is meant to be just a definition, as it were, in one sentence, although that's a bit misleading. But the essential point is that things like field operators and locality emerge from the picture, because when we have a space-time M here like this, going from some hypersurface to another, we can look at a little region of space-time, U, and cut it out. And then what's left is a cobordism from sigma naught together with the boundary of this U to the outgoing hypersurface sigma one. So by the property I mentioned that of taking disjoint unions to tensor products, 
the space associate the functor associates to this disjoint union of two hypersurfaces is the tensor product of the vector spaces. And so each element of this thing, the space associated to the boundary of the little region, gives us an operator from this one to this one. And as we think of U as getting smaller and smaller, such a thing has the role of a field operator operating from this space to this space. And so how does this relate to axiomatization? Well, of course, I didn't say anything about what kind of space times we're considering. Now, real space time corresponds to Lorentzian manifolds. And we're going to say, think of imaginary time as corresponding to Riemannian manifolds. And that raises the question, what plays the role of the upper half plane? So we want to fill in this picture where we have Lorentzian pictures talking about telling us about real physics and Riemannian ones, which are this artificial thing which are going to tell us about the positivity of energy. And we're going to fill in the upper half plane by a category of manifolds equipped with something which I call a complex metric. I'll call these things for short allowable manifolds. So the whole idea of this talk is to define an interesting concept of complex metric manifold, which is going to fit in with the definition of positive energy in quantum field theory. Uh, but first, let me emphasize that the category that I'm going to tell you about, this category of manifolds with complex metrics, is a complexification of the category M, in that M has a discrete collection of connected components, one connected component for each diffeomorphism type of cobordism, and a complex, so, so once you fix the diffeomorphism type of the space-time, what you have to give is a Riemannian metric on it, <clears throat> And we're going to be complexifying the space of Riemannian metrics, thereby getting a complexification of the category of Riemannian cobordisms. And the category of Lorentzian cobordisms is going to lie on the boundary of this category. And I'm going to tell you in, in a moment the concept of Shiloff boundary of a semigroup or a category. For those who haven't met it before, I'll give a very brief suggestion of what that means. And this is going to be the way we're going, by filling in this picture, we're going to give a definition of positive energy in quantum field theory. Uh, I should have just made one further remark. Uh, the kind of semigroups that we got in Wick rotation were self-adjoint semigroups because the Hamiltonian was a self-adjoint operator. Well, this category of complex metrics is going to complex cobordisms, metrics with complex cobordisms, is going to have an anti involution. You can think of it as happening in two stages. We're going to take the complex conjugate of the metric and we're going to make the, think of the cobordism as going the other way. A cobordism from something to something can be regarded as a cobordism in the opposite direction just by turning it round. Uh, we might or might not be considering oriented manifolds, but at least they have a kind of time orientation by definition, so to speak, in that they're cobordisms from something to something else. When we have a representation of this category where on spaces within a product, we're going to say it's self-adjoint if this obvious thing happens. Star means the transposed complex conjugate corresponding to the two things we've done there. Uh, so we'll be interested in self-adjoint representations for this category. Well, so the idea then is that instead of trying to complexify space-time as some kind of complex manifold, we're going to simply complexify the metrics on a given perfectly ordinary space-time. Uh, 
a, a real manifold. Uh, on the boundary of this category, we're going to have the category of Lorentzian cobordisms. And perhaps right at the beginning, I should point out that there's going to be an open category of it consisting of globally hyperbolic manifolds. They're the ones which you can think of, roughly speaking, as ones which are a path parametrized by time in the space of co-dimension one Riemannian manifolds. For instance, if we're doing four-dimensional quantum field theory, a path in the space of three-dimensional Riemannian manifolds, roughly speaking, is a globally hyperbolic four-manifold. One can say it more accurately like this. Of course, the concept of globally hyperbolic is usually not mainly used in connection with things where the spatial slices are compact, but uh, I'm using it in that very special restricted way here. Well, what we prove in our archive preprint is that the theories of the kind we discuss on this open subcategory extend or have boundary values which are unitary representations of these globally hyperbolic things. Anyway, I'll give something more like examples of that later on. But it's a general phenomenon that when you have a complex semigroup, it tends to contain an open subset, the boundary, which is a group, and holomorphic representations of the complex semigroup, which are contraction representations, they, in the sense that they operate by trace class operators, they extend to unitary representations of this group which lies on the boundary of the complex semigroup. I'll give examples of that later, but it's about time I began to tell you the definition. So I want to give you, describe a class of complex valued metrics on a real vector space. The real vector space you think of as being the tangent space at some point. A Riemannian metric is a positive definite inner product on each tangent space of a manifold. Uh, so we are going to consider the tangent spaces and we're going to put complex valued bilinear forms on them, which I'll continue to call G we're as a the the on the screen Sorry, was that a question or just a noise? I think it was just a noise. <laughs> well, so the Riemannian metric, the inner product has to be positive definite. So we're going to put have a positivity condition for a complex valued metric. Before I give you the precise positivity condition, let me point out it's going to imply that the length squared is a complex number which is not on the negative real axis. It can be anywhere else in the complex plane. That means it has a natural square root which lies in the right half plane. So you can think of each tangent vector as having a complex length which lies in the right half plane. Uh, well, we have to now try and say what the positivity condition is. And the first thing I tried to guess, and I think which also Maxine tried to guess, was simply that when you have a Lorentzian metric on a manifold, an indefinite metric, then it might be natural to add to it a positive definite imaginary part that's motivated by situations like this when you're discussing Gaussian integrals. If you take this is a finite dimensional Gaussian integral here, where A is an n by n symmetric matrix. If A is a real matrix, this integral doesn't converge. But if you give it a positive definite imaginary part, however small, it becomes a convergent integral. And then it's a holomorphic function of A when A moves through what's called the Ziegel generalized upper half plane, the symmetric matrices with positive definite real part. And this holomorphic function of A defined in that domain, the half plane, has a boundary value, which one takes to be the value of this for a real symmetric matrix A when the integral doesn't converge. Well, uh, that was a sort of motivating thought in our construction. Uh, it isn't quite right, but it gives me an excuse to tell you something about the Shiloh boundary 
of an open set. You see that this upper half plane is an open subset of a complex vector space. When we have an open subset of a complex manifold with compact closure, its shear off boundary is the smallest closed subset of the actual topological boundary, which dominates the behavior of holomorphic functions on the closure of the domain. That means holomorphic functions which extend continuously to the closure. So you should think of it as a generalized a generalization or an analog of the notions of the extremal points of a convex set in Euclidean space. If you have, say, an open simplex in Euclidean space, it has vertices, which are the smallest, the set of vert n plus one vertices of an open n simplex are the smallest set of points such that when you have a linear function on Rn, the values of the linear function on the vertices dominate the values of the linear function through the interior of the simplex. If we do exactly the corresponding thing using holomorphic functions, then we get the notion of a Shilov boundary. <clears throat> and it, the Shilov boundary is often more interesting than the thing it's the boundary of in its geometry. This Siegel upper half plane is obviously contractible. Uh, it, it doesn't have compact closure the way I've said it, but you can do a very obvious transformation and make it the uh, symmetric complex matrices which have operator norm less than one, and then it will be a bounded ball-like thing <clears throat> in a complex vector space. But its boundary is not quite as simple as you think. I'll come to that in a second. So let's just take two or three examples. Uh, the archetypal example is the polydisc. If you consider the open subset of complex N space where all the variables have <coughs> absolute value less than one, its Shilov boundary, that's of course topologically just a, a disc, a two N dimensional disc. So topologically, its boundary is a sphere of dimension 2n minus 1. But its Shilov boundary, rather obviously, is the n-dimensional torus, where all the variables have absolute value 1. That, you, that follows immediately by applying Cauchy's theorem one variable at a time. And that has a non-abelian generalization. If you consider the n by n matrices with operator norm less than one, uh, then the boundary of this is stratified by the number, the, the boundary is when at least one eigenvalue has absolute value one, and that's stratified by the number of eigenvalues with have, have absolute value one. And the Shilov boundary, the smallest stratum, is in fact precisely the unitary group. The unitary group has real dimension n squared, which is half, the, the, which is equal to the complex dimension of the domain we're considering. So it has half the real dimension of the interior. So it's roughly half, half the dimension of the actual boundary. Uh, and if we were to restrict to, simpler, to symmetric matrices in here, we get symmetric matrices in there. And the Shilov boundary of the Ziegel half plane, which I mentioned, is in fact the Lagrangian Grassmannian of uh, R2n regarded as a symplectic vector space. You think of the n by n symmetric matrices as the things whose graphs are Lagrangian subspaces of R2n, complex Lagrangian, sorry. Uh, if they're real symmetric matrices, they're Lagrangian subspaces of R2n. Uh, but anyway, the Ziegel domain isn't for the moment what we're interested in. I'll come back to it later. What I do want to point out is the domains we're talking about have stratified boundaries, and the Shilov boundary is the smallest stratum. Anyway, where do we get our positivity condition, uh, the one we really want, where does it come from? 
Well, um, let's think first about scalar field theory. So we're interested in the theory of a quantum field given by a real valued function on space time. The, the, the physics is meant to be described by an action functional, which I've written here. This is a good way to think of it, but if you want to be more explicit, we write it like this, where G with an upper IJ is the inverse of the actual Riemannian metric G with a lower IJ. So this thing suggests that what we actually want to happen if we want this action to be positive, which seems a natural thing to try for, is that this matrix has positive, is positive definite, or equivalently that its inverse is positive definite, those two things are equivalent, or in other words, that this thing is in a Ziegel domain, the right half plane, in other words, just multiplying by i, that's the domain I've been speaking about. Uh, so that was sort of the first serious attempt at thinking what a, com a good complex metric might be. But if we did that, that would still have on its boundary Romanian, uh, well, complex valued metrics, which when you went to the boundary still had real inner products of all signatures, not just L Lorentzian ones. There's nothing in this discussion which would single out on the boundary the ones where the symmetric matrix has any particular signature. And if one wants to go a bit further, one realizes that quantum field theory, you certainly need to be able to talk about the electromagnetic field. So we'd like the action for the electromagnetic field, this expression, where this is a two form on space time. We'd like the metric there to have positive real part. And in fact, it's expedient if we're going to consider space time of all dimensions to include all the possible P field actions wherever a is a closed p form, and that's going to lead us to our definition. Uh, when I first mentioned this to Witten, he immediately pointed, I was puzzled because the definition that I'm about to give you doesn't in any way imply anything positive about other kinds of tensorial actions. Supposing we chose some other kind of action than any uh, some other kind of field than a differential form, some kind of symmetric field or something, then we could write down an action for it by a formula vaguely analogous to that. And the definition I'm about to give you wouldn't have any positivity property, especially in that case. And I wondered about that. Why did we think this was so good if it only covered some fields? And Witten immediately pointed out to me a paper he wrote with Weinberg quite a long time ago in which he points out that fields of this kind are the only ones which have good energy momentum tensors in a fairly natural sense. I won't go into that now, but um, the energy momentum tensor is really, if you think of a field theory in the way that I'm defining it as a representation of some category of cobordisms, then the energy momentum tensor, the thing which Weinberg and Witten talk about to single out these fields, that is simply the action on the Lie algebra. You see, if you have a cobordism and you move its Riemannian metric a little tiny bit, then you move it by a symmetric two tensor and the change in the action is uh, the dual of the symmetric two tensors. That's the, and it's called the energy momentum tensor. So it's the derivative, so to speak, at any particular element of the space of cobordisms. And if you want that to have natural properties, and in this very short note, Weinberg and Witten point out that these are the only tensor fields that have well-behaved energy momentum tensors. Anyway, it's more than time that I gave you the actual definition now. The talk is perhaps a bit of an anticlimax after that. Well, when we have an in a complex valued inner product on a real vector space, we can look at the one thing that it gives us 
is a star operator, which takes uh, p-fold skew tensors on V to d minus p fold skew tensors on V, where d is the dimension of V. So we have a star operator, but of course it takes the exterior algebra into the complexified exterior algebra in the complementary dimension. So for any alpha in the exterior, any exterior form on V, star of alpha will be well-defined, but it will lie in the complexification of this space. So this will be a top dimensional form with complex values. Its real part will be a top degree real valued form. So something one could potentially integrate over the form if one had an orientation. And that's the thing which we ask to be a positive volume element. Uh, in terms of the, I pointed out that our G has a preferred square root because we choose the square root of the determinant in the right half plane. And that's why this makes sense. So that's the definition. And certainly it's a very simple definition, but it's not very easy to see what it means actually. And so we're very gratified when, well, I, I was fiddling around with this when I discovered that Maxime had already in a completely different way, decided that the good condition was the following thing. And so it was very comforting that there's an actually very easy to prove theorem which says that this condition is equivalent to the following much more explicit thing. When you have a, a complex symmetric form on a vector space uh, or a real symmetric form, you can't normally find a matrix with respect, a, a basis with respect to which it's diagonal. Uh, because that diagonalizing a complex form is the same as diagonalizing two real valued forms simultaneously by a real basis. And you know, you learn when you're an undergraduate, you can do that if one of the two forms is positive definite. Obviously it's enough if a linear combination of the two is positive definite. And that is certainly implied by the case P equals one of this condition. That was the thing we began from. So when we have, something like this, we know that we can diagonalize it with respect to a basis of V, and then it will have eigenvalues, lambda, and the condition that we find is equivalent to this is that the sum of the angles of these eigenvalues adds up to less than pi. Uh, Graham, so uh, that, can, I, can, I, can I just interrupt you? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that um, uh, you know, this condition can is related to a trick that Hermann Weil introduced many, many years ago in the, in the analysis of the growth of the eigenvalues of operators, where Hermann Weil was taking the wedge K for arbitrary K of a, of a space, and he, he was using the fact that when you take the wedge K, the eigenvalues are the product of different eigenvalues of the original matrix. And uh, it seems to me that the condition that you are writing here is, is kind of obviously following from this uh, Hermann Weyl principle. Uh, certainly that I think is, certainly that fits in with the fact that uh, when we started to think what were the properties of these things, we immediately found we were encountering the sort of typical minimax things that are used in that theory where one uses yeah these what i mean is that are you using the fact that when you take the wedge k of some matrix the, the eigenvalues are the product of diff k different eigenvalues of the original one yes i think so uh, yeah. in fact in our um, particularly for example when we one of the things we realize we ought to prove is that mm -hmm. if you take a vector subspace of V and restrict G, mm -hmm. then you want a, me a, metric, a, metric, a metric which is allowable in our sense 
to remain allowable on the submetric, on sure, the subspace. Yeah. Yeah. And when you restrict to co-dimension one, you find that these arguments interleave in yeah, exactly, exactly the same yes, way yes. that okay. one uses traditionally when studying sets of K eigenvalues. Yeah, yeah. So you mean when you remove a, a rho and polon of a matrix, then then yes. Uh, so one constantly interleaves right. them, and that proves that this property is inherited when you pass to the subspace of V. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. So I, I think very much that's the case. Mm -hmm. Although, I mean, I'm still a little bit puzzled. But let, let me at least point out the, the thing that made us very content with this uh, is that. This immediately shows that on the boundary of our domain, we have Lorentzian metrics, but not any other signatures. Sure, because you see, if we were to have any lambda which was equal to minus one, then it has argument pi. So it's already on the boundary of the domain, even if all the other arguments are zero. So we can't get anywhere near a minus one eigenvalue. We, we certainly can't have two minus one eigenvalues on the boundary, or we would completely get outside the domain where this is true. Anyway, I, I won't talk about the, the, the proof of this is extremely simple, almost, I mean, once we realized that it should be proved that it turned out to be rather obvious. And we proved in the preprint various things such as restrict something about restricting to subspaces. We proved that the metrics which have this property form a domain of holomorphy rather like the Ziegel domain. In fact, it's a it's a co-dimension one complex sub-manifold of a product of Ziegel domains. I think we explained a, thing, a few things like that. And we uh, say a little about its topology. The, the domain itself is contractible, of course, but its boundary is quite interesting. Uh, well, the next thing I want to say is really much the most important thing in the talk. Uh, because it's the idea that we use all the time to do our wick rotating. Uh, you see, the important thing is to understand that when you have a one-dimensional Romanian manifold, it's completely determined by its length up to, up to isometric diffeomorphism. But that's completely false with a complex valued metric. If we have an, uh, an interval with an allowable metric, we have this complex valued function in G describing the metric. And we can always pull it back from the obvious metric on the complex numbers, dz squared, by solving this rather trivial differential equation. And the embedding we get is the analog of parametrizing by arc length. So I drew a picture. Uh, we, we have some interval with a complex metric, we, so, we solve our differential equation beginning, say, at the origin in the complex plane. So we embed our interval in here, and a, a, our allowable metric is simply induced from the metric dz squared on the complex plane. But we might have had this one or this one, which in that have the same length in that sense. Well, that is perhaps alarming. We seem to have, have a lot more of these things than we really wanted. Uh, but the crucial thing is that when we have a holomorphic function of the metric, if it's invariant under reparametrizing the interval, then it only depends on the length. That you can think of as the following principle that if you have a, a Lie algebra acting on a complex manifold and it acts, each element of the Lie algebra acts holomorphically, in other words, by a holomorphic vector field, then if you have a holomorphic function on X, which is invariant under the Lie algebra, it's invariant under the complexification of the Lie algebra. This is a principle which is used endlessly in traditional quantum field theory, where you go from uh, correlation functions defined on Minkowski space to ones defined on domains and the complexification of Minkowski space. I'll come back to that right at the end. But here you see, if we have a function of this 
complex metric interval, which is invariant under diffeomorphisms of the interval, that is to say, reparameterizations, then if you move it a little bit, leaving its end fixed, what we've done is move it by a little tiny vector field, which you can think of as lying in the complexification of the space of tangent vector fields to the interval, the diffeomorphism, the Lie algebra of the diffeomorphisms of the interval. So if you can reparameterize the interval a little bit, you can, re you can push it aside just by going to the complexification of the Lie algebra of the reparameterizations. And then little by little, you can get to any other interval of the same complex length. So that means that when we have a holomorphic representation of the semigroup of allowable intervals, it's the same as a representation of the semigroup, which was, well, here, the right half plane. I rotated my picture through 90 degrees from my first slide where I thought of real time as going horizontally. Now that I'm beginning to think of the Romanian metrics as the more basic thing, I think of them as the real axis and the Lorentzian things as happening in the imaginary direction. Uh, but anyway, this semigroup is the semigroup with which I began the talk, parameterized by a half plane. And you see, although we seem to have allowed much too much in by allowing these complex metrics, the fact that we want holomorphic representations, we're going to ask for holomorphic representations gets us back to where we started from in that case. Uh, and when we go to the boundary, we get a representation of the group of Lorentzian intervals, because you see, if you had a Lorentzian interval, you can think of that as something that goes straight up the imaginary axis. We can deform it just a little bit into the interior of the domain, the upper half plane, and then we'll have an interval like that. We can then do its conjugate, which changes the direction of the cobordism and takes a complex conjugate metric that will make it come down again. We can catenate the two and this going up and down has the same length can be deformed to this very short interval here, which we can make as short as we like. So therefore the thing that represents G and the thing that represents its transposed inverse, so to speak, is um, the inverse cobordism. And that's why on the boundary, we're going to get a unitary group instead of a contraction semigroup. So th this is part of a contraction semigroup and this is part of a contraction semigroup, but they're nevertheless very close to being each other's inverses, even though they're not near the identity in the original semigroup. Uh, so, as I say, that argument is central in the theory, and it's going to apply to Lorentzian space times of all dimensions, uh, globally hyperbolic, because that's, and that's the situation where we can think of them as a path in the space of co-dimension one Riemannian manifolds. So we can do an argument which is schematically the same as what I've just given you, where you've suppressed all the space directions. The only thing is that we need to be able to put the space of metrics on the, on the boundary of something. And so we need the Lorentzian metric that we're going to deform to be real analytic. Otherwise, we can't even deform it a little bit. Now, in the two-dimensional case, we know for lots of, because we know all about the representation theory of diff S1, you don't really need this condition. And it was a very big psychological difference somehow between me and Maxime that I couldn't get him in the least interested in trying to remove this restriction. He, he doesn't really like smooth functions anyway. But I, I feel that if we were treating this properly, we would replace real analytic by smooth there. But the, the, the theorem we proved used real analytic. Uh, yeah, so now let's consider two-dimensional space-time. 
Well, on a surface, if we have a Riemannian metric, it defines a complex structure as soon as we choose an orientation. So a Riemannian metric actually gives us two complex structures, which are each other's complex conjugate. And it's very trivial to check. And a Riemannian metric is determined by the, these things together with the volume element that fixes the conformal factor. An allowable complex metric consists precisely of two complex structures which induce opposite orientations but are not necessarily complex conjugate. So it's a little bit like complexifying a manifold by thinking of the parameter on the manifold as z and then thinking of functions of z and z bar where you don't require z bar to the, be the complex conjugate of z. That's a kind of rather old fashioned way of thinking of the complexification of a manifold. And that's exactly what happens in two dimensional space time. An allowable complex metric is just two complex structures which induce opposite orientations. If they're each other's complex conjugate, then we have a Riemannian metric, but otherwise we don't. And in addition, we have a complex volume element, just as we would expect. At the boundary of the moduli space of complex structures, of course, the complex structure is a way of rotating in a circle in the two in the two dimensional tangent space. On the boundary, the circle becomes a thinner and thinner ellipse, and eventually the complex structure degenerates to a foliation. So on a Lorentzian surface, we have the foliations of left and right moving light lines, which um, which <clears throat> are the boundaries of the space of allowable complex metrics. And we have the, uh, I'll come back to the fact that although we kind of expect each light ray setting out in either direction from the incoming spatial circle to get eventually to the outgoing one, that isn't necessarily what happens. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, meanwhile, I just wanted to mention quickly very well-known material about complex semigroups and groups which sit on their boundary. So the archetypal example is, of course, the Merbius group. So if you consider the Merbius group of transformations of the Riemann sphere, inside we have the subgroup, PSL2R, the modular group of Merbius transformations which preserve the real axis or alternatively, which preserve the open upper half plane. So clearly this real three-dimensional Lie group lies on the boundary of complex semigroup of all complex Mobius transformations, which map half plane to a disk contained in the upper half plane. So you contract the thing into itself. This semigroup is very well known in sturm liouville theory of ordinary differential equations when you're talking about boundary values for ordinary differential equations. You're precisely working in this semigroup. Uh, anyway, the boundary of this semigroup topologically is when the disk touches the boundary of the upper half plane somewhere. Uh, that's, this has six real dimensions. Its boundary has five real dimensions, that's disks which touch the real axis. But to get the smallest layer of the boundary, we have to have the disk actually going exactly to the boundary, and that's this group. Well, that fits in with positivity. Well, uh, the Shilov boundary by definition is compact, and SL2R, you doubtless know, is an open solid torus you can think of it as the positive definite three by three matrices of determinant one times the rotations. You compactify it obviously by adding its boundary, which is a two dimensional torus. You should think of them as the rank one degenerate Mobius transformations that collapse the complement of a point to a point. So the Mobius transformations, which collapse everything except P to another point Q. So they're parameterized by a pair of points on axis. You can think of those as light directions, and that's the 
picture which we already saw. I just want to point out that the composition law of the semigroup, the complex semigroup, isn't well defined on the boundary. It's nearly well defined, but if you compose two of these things, then if you have something that's not defined at P, and then the next thing you want to compose it with happens to be not defined at Q, where all of these points add up, then you're in trouble deciding what the composition is. So the composition law doesn't extend to the boundary, though it very nearly does. Uh, more important about in this example is there are essentially two different kinds of irreducible unitary representations of this group. There is actually another kind called the complementary series, but they're kind of less important and I won't mention them. The two basic kinds are the principal series, which are things like the typical one is the action on the square summable half densities on the, on the real projective line on which this thing acts. That's an obvious irreducible unitary representation. The other obvious irreducible unitary representation is its action on the holomorphic one forms in the, in the upper half plane, where the inner product is given by that formula. And I should have put in the square root of minus one there in order to make it real. I'm sorry, I just noticed that. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, each of these things you can belongs to a series where you take densities of other weight of real part equal to a half and other integral weights of holomorphic form here. Now, it's obvious geometrically that this kind uh, extends to an action on the semigroup of things which embed the upper half plane in itself, because obviously if you have the upper half plane embedded into the upper half plane, then it acts on the holomorphic functions on the upper half plane. You can pull them back. On the other hand, the principal series ones obviously don't extend. There's no reasonable way you can extend a function on the real axis to a, a circle in the upper half plane. And uh, the degenerate, so these ones extend to the Shilov boundary, but the degenerate elements of the Shilov boundary, these things that degenerate Mobius transformations, they're represented by rank one projections. In fact, improper ones in the sense that the axis they project along and to is actually a non-normalizable uh, vector in the Hilbert space. So it needs to be sort of smeared out in some way to make sense of this. And that's actually very similar to what happens in the initial case we considered, where we consider the unitary semigroup generated by the Hamiltonian, the Shilov boundary then it's compactified by adding the point at infinity. And we know that this doesn't extend continuously there, but its value at infinity, we should think of as orthogonal projection onto the kernel of the Hamiltonian. Of course, that's, and what we're doing is generalizing that. Well, <clears throat> haven't got too much more time left, but this group has two very, natural uh, generalizations. The first one, and I'll say very quickly, we can, SL2R is a symplectic group of R2. We can consider another finite dimensional real symplectic group. So we take an R2N, say with its symplectic form, then it acts on the Ziegel half space that I've talked about, the positive definite matrices, positive, sorry, symmetric matrices with positive definite imaginary part. We can think of these as parametrizing the positive Lagrangian subspaces of the complexification of the symplectic vector space. This lies on the boundary of the elements of the complex symplectic group, which map the Siegel domain into its own interior. You see exactly the analog of the upper half plane as before. And indeed, as a complex manifold, this semigroup is just the Ziegel domain of some of two copies of the symplectic space where you reverse the sign of the symplectic form on there. Identify these things with their graphs, which are 
then put it in the Ziegle domain there. And the discrete series representation of that which is most famous actually is a representation only of its double covering is on the quantization of this space. And it's a representation on this by contraction operators. It doesn't quite extend to the whole Shilov boundary. And there's a lot of discussion of ways of interpreting the degenerate symplectic, the symplectic, the contact transformations, which are not, I wrote it down here, the contact, this part of the Shilov boundary gets compactified by adding the graphs of contact transformations, which are not maps like that. And they act by projection operators on the Hilbert space, which is the quantization. I just wanted to mention that this has been discussed very thoroughly and beautifully in, a, again, fairly old paper of Roger Howe, who called it the oscillator semigroup. That was a very famous paper from which I learned a lot, I see, quite a long time ago. I remember when it came out, when I was first getting interested in quantum field theory. Well, uh, I've only got a few more minutes. The other thing that, the other group that really very much resembles SL2R is in fact the group of diffeomorphisms of the circle orientation preserving. That's a Lie group which doesn't have a complexification, but it's Lie algebra, which is the vector fields on the circle, obviously does have a complexification. In the case of the interval, I've already mentioned that. There's a cone in the complexification which consists of the inward pointing vector fields. And they have a kind of, you can think of them as having a kind of exponentiation, which forms, gives us a semi-group of annuli. We just consider complex manifolds which are annuli and which have parametrized boundary circles. They form a semi-group under concatenation. I call it the semi-group of annuli. And that's a semi-group on whose boundary this group of diffeomorphism sits. So that's an extension to infinite SL, PSL2R is a subgroup of this, a three-dimensional subgroup. And the semi-group I mentioned before is a three-dimensional complex subgroup of this. So I've just extended that example to infinite dimensions. This group, is well known to have a class of representations, which my contribution to the subject was to, in my book with Andrew Presley a long time ago, I made a big play for introducing the name positive energy for these representations, which had always been called lowest weight unitary representations. They are for obvious reasons, the boundary values of holomorphic representations of the semigroup. And the other kinds of representations one knows of this group similarly are not, do not extend in this way. And at the boundary, as I've already said, the complex structure becomes a foliation. And the diffeomorphism group is an open subset of the space of foliations, which, but the foliations needn't be diffeomorphisms. In other words, an, a Lorentzian annulus needn't be globally hyperbolic the light lines might go into a spin being all tangent to a closed leaf halfway along. And then these light lines will never get to the other end. In other words, it's not be globally hyperbolic. Uh, I tried to sell this as a two dimensional analog of a black hole, but when I said that to Witten, he didn't like the idea at all, I have to say. I'm going to finish in my last minute by telling you something which is, in a sense, almost a funny story. Um, this paper originated, this note I wrote with Maxime about 20 years ago when I was visiting the IHS and I gave, I had to give a talk and I'd been thinking about this for years and years because I should say, Maxime and I, everything in this talk, as far as two dimensions is concerned, 
was certainly done independently by me and Maxim Konsevich in the 1980s, at a time I was almost exactly double his age. Uh, and I think both of us had been vaguely thinking about it in between and being asked to give a talk at the IHS, I gave a talk about 20 years ago and talked about my ideas on this subject. Maxim came along and pointed out that he'd thought a lot more deeply about the subject. And he had the other characterization, which I gave in this talk as a thesis, as a theorem of the metrics in terms of the sum of the arguments of their eigenvalues. And he agreed that we would write a joint paper and I should write it up, which I hastily did over the next 20 years. And then we met to discuss our final draft. Just before the beginning of the present pandemic, we met in Paris. And out of the blue, I asked him, what on earth made you think of that strange characterization? And he told me why he thought of it, which I'm about to tell you. He was thinking in terms of the vacuum expectation, but this is when he was an undergraduate or something. He was thinking in terms of the vacuum expectation values of traditional quantum field theory. And it's known that they're the boundary values of holomorphic functions in a domain in complexified Minkowski space, where this is the holomorphic envelope of something which is called the permuted extended tube. So in that classical theory, one of the theorems one proves is that if one takes the standard Euclidean, that is to say positive definite metric subgroup of subspace of complexified Minkowski space, then this domain contains a subregion, which is the space of all distinct catapults of points in the Euclidean space. So this is a famous theorem of classical uh, axiomatic quantum field theory that the domain to which the vacuum expectation values extend contains this space of distinct catapults of the Euclidean subspace. And Maxime asked the question, uh, what real subspaces of Euclidean, uh, of complexified Minkowski space have this property? And he found that it was precisely the ones on which the induced metric is allowable in our sense. It was then quite hard, we realized, that was the first time I realized that that was his motivation. I had never asked him before. And I said, well, we ought to write down a proof of that. And he told me his sketch of a proof, which was by something called the, um, uh, what's it called? The um, tube theorem of, um, I can't think of his name, sorry, of course I'm too old. Uh, and we quickly realized that we needed a slight strengthening of the theorem to make our, the result as obvious as Maxime thought it was. And he quickly asked all the com complex analysts around Paris if this was known. And it seemed to be slightly more general than any of the generalizations of this classical tube theorem. And Maxime in a twinkling of an eye proved a generalization of the classical tube theorem, and that's in our, uh, in our little note in the archive, our little paper in the archive, and that proof is entirely due to him, I must say, and I was quite amazed by how he did this, really, in the twinkling of an eye. Anyway, this was the other motivation for the definition of our allowable metrics, but I've gone over time, so I really will stop now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for Graham? I have one. I have one question, uh, uh, Graham, which is the following. I mean, after all, when you what you did, you took like the Schrödinger picture, but let me take the Heisenberg picture. 
And uh, which means that, for instance, if I shift the Hamiltonian by a constant, then everything remains the same because I'm considering yeah. automorphisms of the algebra of observables. And then my question is the following. I mean, the um, positivity of energy that you were uh, presenting is a special case of what happens when you have a temperature, inverse temperature beta, which is a KMS condition. Yes, very much so, yes. Yeah, and uh, so, uh, I mean, my question is the following. I mean, uh, what you were saying about groups being uh, seal of boundary of uh, semi-groups, which have a complex structure, would suggest a generalization of the KMS condition for group representations on, on sister algebras of these larger groups, actually. At least, I mean, for, for, at least for the positive uh, generalization of the positivity of energy, I don't know about the temp uh, inverse temperature beta, because I don't know wh what replacement you have in your framework for that. Uh, well, um, obviously, this is a question I should be asking you rather than you should be asking me. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, uh, I'm but, just asking uh, if you, if I you did, thought about it. Well, I, um, well, um, but I did, I did think about this KMS condition. And the way it comes into the way I think about it is, uh, and I, I was very interested in this, but I've never, and I, I again wrote some preprint, which I've never done anything with. In my understanding, the place where the KMS, where, where the modular theory came in, mm -hmm. came when you wanted to discuss the locality of the state space itself. So these mm -hmm. vector spaces, which we assign to a sigma, a co-dimension one hypersurface, mm -hmm. if we want to cut that into half by something of co-dimension two, mm -hmm. then uh, we want to discuss how the um, how the Hilbert space or whatever it is, which is associated to the compact hypersurface, factorizes when we cut the surface, the oh, hypersurface into yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. And uh, my picture is that associated to each half of the hypersurface, we get not a Hilbert space, well, we get a Hilbert space, but one which comes equipped with an action of some von Neumann algebra, which we should think of as <laughs> certainly an yes, like, like in the one dimension. Yes, of course. Yeah, sure. Yes, sure, and sure. then and then the way we bond these things together, yeah, but in order to get this space for the compact hypersurface, is to do what Anthony Wasserman taught me. Oh, the fusion rules. Yeah, the tensor yeah, product. Because, because fusion. The, yes, the sure. von Neumann algebra tensor product. Yeah, yeah. So sure. the category of things which we associate to a space-time with boundary mm -hmm. should be some representation space of a von Neumann algebra. Yeah, certainly, yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand. And, uh, well, uh, and the, the modular group, mm -hmm. on the one hand, you see, you should think of these things as potentially overlapping these two half hypersurfaces as overlapping in a little flap mm -hmm. and rotating the, the little flap inside around its axis. So that's a circle of possible rotations. Mm -hmm. It's a co-dimension two thing in the space time. Mm -hmm. So rotating it around that circle is the imaginary rotation in the modular group. Yeah, yeah, so you mean it's a period. Uh, and the temperature, yeah. usual modular, group, the radial action in that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that and so I thought of the modular group as coming in when one, co-dimension two phenomena in space-time. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, uh, sorry, that's a, that would really be the subject of a different talk, I'm afraid. Sure, sure. Sure, no, but I mean, a simpler question was, do you have in your picture a uh, treatment for uh, non-zero temperature? Uh, well, uh, again, I would hope so in the following sense that you see that non-zero temperature wouldn't make sense with a compact spatial slice. But if you really wanted to do anything like serious physics or cos certainly cosmology, you would need to have slices. Well, well I should say the, the formalism mm -hmm. 
the axiomatization only works when we have trace class semigroups. Yeah, and that sure. corresponds to having only finite regions of space time. Mm. So we would really always need to work with a boundary condition. And that would mean we would have to work with Hilbert spaces, which had something like a von Neumann algebra acting on them. And that yeah. would be the temperature state. Mm. So we would be doing the whole thing with a functor which took values not simply in Hilbert spaces, but in these modules, yeah, presumably, yeah, sure. okay. where the module depended on the temperature. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Graham, I asked um, a representation theory expert, what's so special about the, the oscillator representation, this very representation of the metaplectic group, which figures into how duality and representation theory. And he answered by quoting a theorem of Roger Howe about um, commutants of groups, commutants inside of groups being compatible with commutants inside of von Neumann algebras. But I, I wonder, is, is there a, a better answer or a different answer using the Shiloh boundary? Um, um, well, once again, I, I suspect that this is a question that I shall be asking of quite a few members of my audience rather than the other way around. Um, uh, I, I have did think a bit about how duality when I was working on loop group representations. And personally, I think it's still something in there, in that situation, it's very important that if you look at the loop group of something like UMN, so the dimension of the unitary group is a product of M and N, then you have inside it the loop group of UN and the loop group of UM, and they commute, and they are a kind of how pair. And there's a very famous theorem, which is probably due, I think, to Igor Frankel, which says that what's called the basic representation of the loop group of the product uh, decomposes into a, a finite sum of tensor products of positive energy loop group representations. So, so exactly like what happens for the unitary group of, when you restrict to the product of two subunitary groups. But there's no good understanding that, that that's used in a lot of explicit calculations in two-dimensional conformal field theory. But it's something which I've never really thought anyone had a very, I mean, you, it's proved entirely computationally by looking at all the representation theory. And I'm sure there should be a better way of looking at it. And that, that's the place where I've come upon that how duality in connection with two-dimensional quantum field theory. But all I can say is it's much used in concrete applications and calculations, but I don't really know what to say about it. Thank you. Further questions or comments for Graham? If not, then uh, thank you once again for a, for a wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. Really a wonderful way to fin finish the semester. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. It's been a great pleasure.